Hi, my name is Shania Bopa and welcome to my interview with the Microsoft AI CEO, Mustafa Suleiman. He has a long history of innovation in the space, true leadership. He's a disruptor in so many ways. And today, Microsoft launched some really exciting advancements and new research in an area where we could see lots of change. We can one, see so much support for patients who have long journeys in diagnostics. Two, see cuts to the costs in healthcare, which again, if you're in the US or Canada, it is something we desperately need. And so welcome to the conversation, grab a coffee, grab a matcha, have a seat, and I'm so excited for the critical conversation. Coming to this interview as a patient, as a healthcare provider, as someone who's going to be a clinician scientist, and understanding AI fundamentally. I love sharing AI tools to do it all well, and I believe that you can. And so hopefully you feel inspired and excited throughout this episode. Drop any questions that you may have, and let's get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's conversation. We have Mustafa, who is the CEO of the Microsoft AI division, and I'm so excited to chat today. We have a couple of rapid fire questions about the new launch, which is super, super exciting. And yeah, we can just take it away. Great. Let's do it. Welcome. Super excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Amazing. Well, my first question, over 50 million people turn to AI tools like Microsoft Copilot daily for health advice. What does that say to you about the current health care system and the state of health literacy? Yeah, every day we get 50 million sessions on Copilot or Bing that are basically about health information seeking. And I think what that basically says is that people are understandably anxious and worried. They want to learn more and they want information that's presented in a really accessible way that they can understand. And that's why we've seen the volume of queries go through the roof over the last few years. And as a patient myself and as a scientist, I personally use Copilot every single day for my health questions. And it's been so helpful for not only my confidence building when I walk into that doctor's office, but for my critical analysis of the state of my health and what it measures up to in relation to the statistics. Now, as a scientist and as a future physician, I'm also a patient and I've been in six different specialist offices over my lifetime. So I can see the beauty of healthcare delivery, but I can also feel that frustration as a patient. Diagnostic timelines are absolutely excruciating. Endometriosis, the average time, seven to 10 years. MS, two to five years. Fibromyalgia, five years. Celiac disease, six to 10 years. These timelines are detrimental to patients, costly to our healthcare system, but there are a number of issues wrong in our healthcare system. Why did you choose to target improving diagnostic timelines in the advancement of medical superintelligence? I mean, you gave a perfect summary of why we're doing what we're doing. You know, people don't realize how long diagnosis takes. And that's because assembling the case history is an enormous task. And then deciding, given the fragments of case history that emerge, which tests to do when, when you have to factor in cost, complexity, timeline to booking, additional anxiety that that might cause to the patient. That's a real challenge. And so what we're trying to develop is a system that can help clinicians to make that decision more accurately, involving lower cost and making it as effective as essentially the best clinicians in the world. And was your vision clear from the beginning when you started dreaming up MAI Diagnostic Orchestrator. Yeah, I mean, we have worked, actually, my colleagues and I have worked on health for almost a decade. We started DeepMind Health back in the day, uh, you know, 10 years ago. And, you know, we've always believed that the, the real mission of AI is to use it to change the world and to improve the condition of humanity. And these are basically prediction engines which love large amounts of data. And when given the right information, they can produce absolute. So this has been a long-standing ambition of ours, and I'm just so excited to see it working in practice now. And, you know, the research looks really promising. And now I went through fertility treatments and froze my eggs for my 25th birthday. During that process, I was turning to AI tools to help me critically assess the statistics. It was a tool to help me trust my doctor and help me form that bond. Do you think that improving diagnostic timelines and accuracy is going to negatively or positively impact the human connection element of healthcare? 
Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think anything that reduces the time it takes or the time that a clinician gets to spend with a patient, um, you know, is a problem. And so if, you know, this tool basically means that doctors get more time to sit and talk through the implications of a diagnosis or the possible treatment pathways or the possible next steps, that's the judgment, the kindness, the care that many clinicians go into medicine wanting to actually do. And so this should save time, improve accuracy, reduce cost, and therefore give more time for doctors to spend directly with patients. A side note, for a few years, I was building a startup to share health information and diagnostic information to pediatric patients in the eMERGE through cartoons. Physicians are typically the educators, and that's right. not their job. Their job is to diagnose appropriately, create a treatment plan, make sure the patient feels comfortable with the next steps. I'm personally so happy and so excited for this advancement as a patient and as a future clinician. But why do you think patients might be hesitant to trust AI in their healthcare experience? And what might Microsoft be doing differently to address that hesitation now or in the future? Well, one of the reasons why people have been concerned in the past is because they don't have transparency over how the decision was made. But in the sequential diagnostic orchestrator that we've created, you can actually see the model in real time asking questions of the case history and exploring different themes of a particular patient's story. And so you can actually, in theory, obviously we haven't deployed this yet, but you know, you can imagine applications where both the patient and the doctor get to watch the judgment in real time, or even go back and audit the judgment and look at all the tests that were suggested, look at the types of questions that were being asked of the data, look at the debate that happens between different sort of medical agents. And that I think will go a long way to building trust because the content is interpretable and transparent. And obviously that's a key, you know, necessary prerequisite to trust. And I really admire the emphasis on transparency and being able to see the model in real time. But if a diagnostic error occurs using the system, who is responsible and how are we thinking about that accountability? Yeah, I mean, it's an open question. This is research today, so it's not deployed in production. We've got a lot to figure out. It's very early days. And, you know, I don't have a good answer for how that would work out just yet. Okay, next question from a scientist and from a future clinician. But if AI tools like MAI Diagnostic Orchestrator is smarter than me, why would I trust that it could still listen to me? You know, if I'm the doctor to my patients. I can foresee advancements becoming more and more rapid. Where are the boundaries going to lie? Maybe this is too early to ask of a question, but are those considerations that are happening right now? Was that your cat? <laughs> I'm cat sitting cool. my friend's cats. Yeah. It's their first time seeing me on camera. That's very cool. So look, I think that these kinds of tools to be effective need to have boundaries. And you establish boundaries and limitations of the technology once you follow up the research with a clinical evidence base, right? So that means randomized controlled trials in very restricted settings with full observation from study participants, medical participants, and obviously the system ethicists and all the governance frameworks around that. And that takes time. So it's going to be a good few years before this stuff makes its way into the real world practice. And I appreciate the rigor that is going into this and making sure that it's something that's appropriate, not only for patients, but for clinicians. One thing that I was thinking through when reading the report, I specialize in co-design and community-based participatory research methodology, which essentially means whenever we're designing an intervention, we have patients and partners and clinicians and everyone's at the table from idea all the way to execution. Now, when we're thinking about patients from marginalized groups or folks who have been historically excluded, it's critical for inclusion, especially of these tools to make sure it has the equity, diversity, and inclusion aspects that's necessary for adequate healthcare management and diagnosis. What do you foresee or is there any secret or small like glimpse that you could share on how patients might be included in the development and execution? I think today, quite often when you get a diagnosis from your doctor, they provide you with an expert opinion. Sometimes they might give a little bit of justification or a bit of the rationale. And then rarely you might even get a second opinion. 
right? And after the fact, when treatment paths are really started to even be cast down, then you get an option as a patient to kind of make some decisions. I think the opportunity here is to have the patient voice represented in the chain of debate, these agents that try to represent the different roles. Maybe they're, you know, concerned about efficiency in the system. Maybe they're representing different expertise or different specialist areas. Maybe they're representing the patient just as a patient advocate might in hospital. So this is a system that is inherently discursive and the debate is a key part of the, the reasoning process. And so you can definitely imagine representatives of marginalized groups or, you know, even the patient themselves being represented in the discussion. Amazing. I think that's so important. And sometimes we often don't acknowledge that component when we're building tools and especially tools at this large scale. Do you think this will redefine what it means to be a physician? or even a patient in the next decade? I think that we're on the cusp of a big transformation here. I think if this continues to prove out and, you know, this finding holds, then it could well be that diagnosis, you know, is cheaper, faster, and more accurate than the best clinicians in the world. And that is going to change what it means to be a clinician. I mean, we'll clearly focus much more on treatment and on care and being physically present with patients, which I think many clinicians will love. And, you know, ho hopefully that works out because I think that would be better for the entire system. And what would you say to a patient who asks, how will this make me feel safe? heard and seen and not just processed by an algorithm. I think the primary focus has got to be on accuracy and cost. If it's cheaper and it's more accurate, that is unquestionably going to be transformative. And then it should be up to the human in the system to figure out how to offer care, kindness, support, empathy to be, you know, offer the kind of human touch in the, uh, the course of the treatment. And so this tool is not replacing that human connection or that human touch. It's merely a tool in the physician's toolkit to administer that care. That's right. Yeah. My second last question. Have you ever been a patient and how do you feel emotionally about this advancement in healthcare? I feel super excited about it. My mother was a nurse in the National Health Service for many years and also a school nurse. And so, yeah, that's definitely been, you know, a big inspiration for me for a long time. And my last question for you today, what is one piece of advice you have for patients, consumers, clinicians, everyone who's reading the hot news today? I think, you know, probably on the lines of what you were saying earlier, which is use these tools try them out, be bold and, you know, introduce them into your lives and into your workflows because they really can deliver magic. They're not perfect yet and they're still in the earliest stages of their formation. So if you want to shape them, then participate in that. And now is the time. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate, appreciate your empowerment. That concludes our interview.